Hello, and welcome to another episode of Finlandia Foundation Nationals In Conversation series. My name is Mirva Johnson, and I am a member of Finlandia Foundation Nationals Young Leaders Board. Today, I am joined by Naomi Moriyama, a U.S.-Japan marketing professional and co-author of three nonfiction books on traditional Japanese home-cooked meals and their health benefits. Uh, she is here to discuss her latest co-authored book, The Sisterhood of the Enchanted Forest, Sustenance, Wisdom, and Awakening in Finland's Karelia. Thanks so much for, to, for joining us today, Naomi. Thank you. Uh, from how you ended up in Finland to the various connections you weave together in your book, we have much to discuss, and I am very much looking forward to discuss how it all came together. So let's get started. Could you briefly tell us about yourself and your motivation for writing this particular book? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I was born and raised in Japan, and I attended college for two years in, in Illinois, in America, in the middle of uh, cornfields. And I went back to Japan, got a job at an ad agency. And in my late 20s, they sent me to their headquarters in New York. I moved to New York. And that's where I stayed. I spent almost all my adult life living in New York City. Um, and then we had an opportunity to come to Finland. And this um, had a very significant impact on my life. And I wanted to tell stories, my experiences. This is basically a love letter to the people of Finland that I met while we were here. Fantastic. Um, so how did you end up moving to Finland and why Yoensu in particular? Yes, um, good question. In 2015, my husband uh, and then co-author, William Doyle, was selected as a Fulbright Scholar and to study or research uh, Finnish, the world well-known Finnish education um, and also teach uh, communications to graduate students. And the university that accepted him was in Joensu, uh, University of e Eastern Finland. And I say everything starts from UEF and ends at UEF. So your previous books have focused on traditional Japanese home-cooked meals and their health benefits. How did your previous work and interest influence your time in Finland? Yes, William and I wrote three books on traditional Japanese home-cooked meals and lifestyle and their health benefits. Um, it's a love letter to my mother Chizuko, who is a self-taught fantastic chef. When I asked her why she, how she got to be such a great chef, she said she wanted to give her family, that's my dad, my sister, myself, the gift of health. And she thought that health is the most important thing in life. Uh, to have a productive life. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. And I wanted to share this knowledge uh, with the rest of the people. So I wanted to de demystify Japanese foods and help people learn how to uh, make very simple, delicious uh, food. So during our six months stay in North Karelia, what I wanted to do was learn regional cuisines. I thought that this is a good way for me to connect with the local people. And on the very first day, driving from Yoensu Airport to the city center, I asked Professor Helmi, who was a sponsor of my husband at UEF, where I could start this process. And then she said, oh, go to Marta Cafe. It's an open cafe in Tori, a uh, city center, an uh, open market, and then they serve Karelian pies, which is a quintessential North Karelian delicacy. And not only that, the volunteers actually hand make them on the premise. So that afternoon we were there um, tasting this wonderfully delicious Karelian pies and then actually have the recipe from Mata in the book. So I hope you get to make them. And uh, that's the beginning of my journey. So your book really quite beautifully reflects on your time in North Karelia, the connections you made, the power of nature and the food it provides, and the role of gender equality in Finland over time. 
Uh, it seems that the Marta organization really especially influenced your time in North Karelia. So could you say a few more words describing the group and your own involvement and just kind of how are nature and good food connected? Yes. So the Marta organization is one of the world's original women's empowerment groups and it founded in 1899 when most of the Finland was rural, poor and still under Russian domination as a not-for-profit home economics organization to promote women's well-being and family quality of life. And the mission of Mata organization today is still the same. It is to give people self-confidence and skills to take care of themselves and their families. Um, this is why they not only they sell pastries and notori, but they have cooking lessons, nutrition lessons, supermarket, how to shop in supermarket, who is one of their central themes. And then they teach how to grocery shop, and then in recent years, like with refugees, they take them to supermarket um, and then show them how to shop, take them into the forest, how to forage, what not to eat, what not to uh, pick. And Martha says food intelligence is essential to one's wellness. Wow, this message really resonated with me because it's basically my mother's mantra and then became mine. And I realized that the Mata and I share the same mission, that is to help people eat well, to thrive. And uh, Mata actually took me even further because I, in the first meeting I had with them, I discovered that they go foraging in the forest um, and they're a mushroom Mata. And I jumped to that uh, opportunity. I grew up eating shiitake mushrooms. And if you're a vegan vegetarian in Japan, like the broth is made with mushrooms. Um, so I said, oh, can somebody take me in the forest? And they're like, sure, like we do this all the time. So now I became instead of, or in addition to farm to table advocate, um, now it's forest to table. And this book really built on wellness. The Japanese book was about mostly food and then like incidental exercises, lifestyle. But uh, this book expands on that. So not only um, food and of course mushrooms and berries and herbs that you get from the nature have incredible health benefits. Um, also, then walking in the forest is really good for you. There's a science evidence that shows that uh, when you inhale uh, chemical compounds from the plants, your health improves and exercise is good for you. And I really enjoyed foraging, which is like slow walking rather than like hiking or running, rushing through the place. Um, so now, uh, speaking of foraging, I will read the Mushroom Queen chapter from the book. The Mushroom Queen. Then the trees began to grow, all the slender saplings stretching. Pine trees spread their bushy tops, and the spruces flower crowned, birches lifted from the hollows. From the light loam alders rose. In the bogs the checo cherry, chok cherry bloomed, beaded with abundant fruit. On the barrens junipers, beautiful with berry clusters. The Kalevala. Go on, pick it, said Pivy the mushroom queen. I'm afraid, I mumbled. She pointed to a prominent looking mushroom standing exposed all by itself on the pine needle and twig laden ground. It had a saucer like brown cap in two inches in diameter and a sturdy beige stem. The mushroom looked so picture perfect that I thought I might accidentally mutilate it while trying to separate it from Mother Earth. I was wandering in a dense forest with master mushroom forager, Pivy, and a group of several other matas. My boots squished on an uneven, cushiony carpet of moss and fallen leaves, giving my knees, legs, and back a tender workout. An hour earlier, before we set off on our hike, Pivy opened her car trunk in the parking lot 
and produced a supply of homemade mushroom cookies and a thermos full of delightful, mellow, nutty, vanilla-tasting chaga mushroom tea. Chaga mushrooms appear as charcoal black clusters on the side of birch trees with a golden brown interior. And for centuries, they've been used in traditional medicine in Finland, Russia, and elsewhere. Today, chaga can be enjoyed as a tea or as a powder or liquid to add to soups or smoothies. And researchers are finding that there may indeed be health benefits from the mushroom, including antioxidant, anti-cancer, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, and pro-immune system effects. Fortified by tea and cookie, mushroom powder, power, mushroom power, we set off into the woods. There was no path, no trace of civilization, only birch, pine, spruce trees rolling over gentle hills in all directions. My eyes scanned around the magical landscape of lush, expansive vegetation. Layers of bright green moss and whitish gray reindeer lichen covered rocks, one foot tall miniature trees, fallen branches, twigs and leaves, ferns, lowberry bushes, wildflowers and grasses, an ant hill, white birch trunks, stately dark brown pine trunks soaring into the sky, and some fallen trunks leaning on top of each other. Glittering light streamed through leaves, branches, and tree trunks, casting diagonal streaks and shadows in the forest. I inhaled rich vapors of moist pine, heard unhushed conversations of wispy wind and birch leaves, and sensed my breathing synchronized with nature's pulses. My physical, emotional, and spiritual beings were completely blending with the surroundings. The most profound sensation of bliss filled my body and soul, a mystical sensation that I had never known existed or was possible. So, what about sauna? Ah, oh, I love sauna. And it's another wellness lifestyle uh, this country offers. To me, sauna has two extremes. One is heat, very intense heat that comes from the steam in the sauna house. And then very cold, um, usually a body of water, like a lake or a river, uh, in my case today. Uh, the Gulf of Finland, jumping into a body of water and you alternate. Uh, to me, it is a mind-body sensation and it's rejuvenation and relaxation, meditation. It's an addiction and it's a very good addiction uh, that you want to keep and it's a way of life. Oh, that, that is so well put. <laughs> um, I'm also wondering, so do you think that motherhood and having a young child with you all influenced your experience with North Karelia and just with Finland in general? Yes, definitely, because I got to experience what it was like to be a parent um, of a second, a second grader at a Finnish public school. And basically what I found was there is very little to do as a parent vis-a-vis -vis school. Um, for example, for commuting uh, in New York, either my husband or I, we took our son to school and picked him up. We did this until he was sixth grade. At, on second, seventh grade, he was ready to go to school on his own, riding a subway and walking. And in Finland, already um, second grade, um, he just walked to school and that gave us a lot of time. And then also that made me realize the question of like who is responsible for uh, early child care. Um, and in the US, you either you, you do it yourself, which is time, 
or hire somebody to do it, which costs money. And it's wonderful to live in a society that's being taken care of. And then that also helps children become independent in a natural way. And there are very uh, few meetings uh, compared to the, the schools in New York. The, there, we were very hands off. I think that that's just understood that in Finland, teachers were trusted and they were doing the job. And then like I was to do my job and not to meddle with what's happening in school. And in New York, some parents can be busy themselves just volunteering to fundraise, even for private schools that charge a lot of money. I mean, tuitions. Um, the secondly, I also met women, uh, made friends who were mothers, mothers of my son's classmates, and they were all professionals. And one was, uh, one is a professor at the university and researcher. Another one, also a um, researcher, computer engineer. She was also an immigrant, and sh she was such an uh, inspiration for me because she learned Finnish, mastered Finnish. She was raising twin boys for our son's age and had a full-time job as a computer engineer. And then on later years, he, she pursued a PhD and it was all possible uh, for her to do so. And of course, she's a remarkable person. I think society helped her to achieve uh, multitask all of these things as well. Fantastic. It's, it's interesting how you compare this, this stark contrast between the systems, but also I want to discuss a little bit more um, the role of women in Finnish society in general. So you also, in your book, you highlight some of Finland's super women like Eva Ryunenen, Riitta Uosukainen, Darja Halonen, and of course, Sanna Marin. This seemed like a really natural connection given the um, uh, uh, other women that you had met and the sisterhood that you were welcomed into. So can you just discuss a little bit the choices to highlight these particular figures? Of course. Well, gender progress uh, was and is the most inspiring features of this nation. And we wanted to find out why. And, and as you say, we met a lot of wonderful women and men. Uh, um, and a major theme woven through this book is gender equality. Eva Reinenen is a sculptor who worked extensively with wood and she had a very deep spiritual connection with wood trees and that alone was very important because of my experiences in the forest and then the Finnish people's uh, lifestyle with in deep in the forest. She, I also visited her studio house and a chapel she and her husband built on the a property and basically every surface, interior surface, sometimes exterior, like the doors, walls, furniture, everything was curved by her. And it's an astonishing place and you could really feel she's not only talented, but also very uh, like an engineer. She, she um, built her own tools and I highly recommend anybody, everybody visiting um, those uh, places there, like now museum. And Rita Usokainen is a super polit politi politi politician, super woman, and she has roots in Karelia. And she taught at University of Joensuu, which is a pr predecessor of University of Eastern Finland. One of the most striking things I heard from her was that when I asked her about women's um, gender progress, she said it's about a partnership between men and women. She said men in Finland value women and it's a partnership. And then I thought that that was really remarkable. It's not a competition between women and men. And this is a recurring theme that I, we hear from the people um, in this country. People hear the collective Finnish desire to care for each other um, and for everybody to thrive, which is a wonderful thing. And Tyre Halonen, of course, we cannot discuss Finnish women's uh, gender progress without her. She's the female president, the first female president from 20, 2000, 2000 to 2012. And, and she's very active, very much in various fields. And she was so, um, we were so grateful that we could interview her as well.
So you touched on this a little bit, but throughout the book, you make a point of highlighting Finland's successes, yet still indicate where there is work left to do. So how is Finland doing in terms of gender equality and where is there still work to be done? Most of you in the audience know that 36-year-old female prime minister, Sanna Marin, has a governing coalition of five political parties, all led by women. And the culmination of this gender, um, national gender uh, equality push started even before the independence in 1917. In 1906, the first, Finland was the first country to give women full political right to vote, uh, both vote and run for the office. A year later, the 19 women elected to the parliament and as the first female parliamentarians in the world. And Lucina Wagman uh, was one of them. She's also a founding uh, member of the MARTA organization. Today, roughly half of the nation's legislative and ministerial positions are held by women. And Finland ranked number two in last year's World Economic Forum Global Gender Gap Report behind Iceland. Um, that compares to our native countries, the US was number 30 and Japan 120 out of 156 countries. And yes, every society has challenges and in work in progress, this is never ending. And for gender equality, I know that Finland is continued to work on reducing pay gap and an increasing female participation in historically male dominant fields such as science and technology. Another challenge the society faces is racial discrimination, but coming from the US and Japan, I know this is practically all societies face with that. It's almost like a human nature. And so, um, but this is one of the challenges and then they're working to, to reduce it. So I appreciate how vividly also in your book you described a lot of these kind of individual interactions and the feelings of contentment, peace, fulfillment that you um, that you experienced from various trips into the forest. And it's a benefit that's uh, hard to quantify, but just really obvious when you experience it. And so I'm, I'm, why, why should we care about preserving forests and what can Americans learn from the Finnish relationship with nature? Yes, um, I experienced such peace and bliss in nature. I read a fray, a paragraph from that in the book, and in this is, it comes often in throughout the book. And I think it's because the more direct my um, contact with the nature, more intense that experience was. And in a way, it was like I felt one, one with the nature. I felt one with the mother nature. And it was almost like, it's almost like going home, like going back to my mother's inside the tummy. Like, you know, you have this secure, beautiful feeling and I don't know where my body ends and where the nature starts. And I think it's because I am a nature. We are not all nature. And we forget living in civilization. You know, I remind you that I grew up in Tokyo and then lived in Manhattan most of my life. So like I, for, I sort of didn't know that this was natural. Um, and we, we should care about and preserving forests, lakes, on uh, oceans because it's all connected. And without nature, let's face it, there is no human species. So, um, and then it's easy, I would say, to, to realize that in a country like Finland, because life is so ingrained deeply with the nature, there's very little separation, even in a city like Helsinki. Um, and in comparison in the US or in New York where I lived, uh, talk of sustainability, ecology, all that seems a lot of intellectual exercises people I met in North Carolina ha, were, um, their lives were really deeply intertwined with the nature. 
and I see, of course, like I talked about foraging in the forest. I watch, I see people ice wash, I mean ice fish on frozen lakes. And, and then much of the forests I understand in Finland are owned by just individuals. So if you own the forest as your uh, wealth property, of course you care. And Helsinki, even a city like Helsinki, where we lived since August 2020, I'm usually walking through parks to get to my supermarket. And we live in front of the park that connects it to even bigger park, Central Park, and it feels like you're in the forest. I can snowshoe walk or cross-country ski uh, in the wintertime, just step out of my apartment building. We live in the middle of the city. And during the summer, we can just walk to a beach. It's not uh, an excursion like it might be uh, elsewhere. And I realized living in Finland, the nature is really one of the ultimate luxury. It's priceless and then we do need to take care of it. Now um, I'm going to read uh, another chapter, family outing from the book. Family outing. She came out of the darkness, misty rain, with a two-year-old girl strapped into a bucket on the back of her bicycle. So glad you couldn't make it, she exclaimed. Her name was Irmeli Mastalahi. She was a world-renowned professor of natural resources governance and a fellow parent at the university teacher training lab school where our eight-year-old son were becoming fast friends, despite the fact that neither boy yet spoke the other's language. Her stately, commanding beauty evoked images by Raphael or Botticelli, and like many Finnish women I was getting to know, her personality seemed suffused in a kind of calm, confident determination, contentment, and serenity. Maybe they're all blissed out by all the fresh air and in the forest, I mused myself. Over lunch one day, Irumeli told me, in my childhood, the forest was my playground. Back then, my parents didn't transport me to different hobbies or activities. I started going into the forest along when I was five years old to go skiing, hiking, and picking berries and mushrooms. The family cat and dog came with me and watched over me. I only got lost once and not for long. There's not much to be afraid of in the forest. In Finland, only city folk and politicians are afraid of the forest. Like a lot of Finns, we had lots of trees on our property and they were our bank account. My parents planted, harvested, and sold trees for a living. It provided our family's main income. You learn respect for nature when you look after such a bank account, she added. I have epilepsy, which can be triggered by stress. So even today, the forest is quite important neurologically and psychologically for me as a place for healing. Besides being a fellow public school mom and one of my guides to the local customs in Finland, Irumeli was a professor and one of the world's leading social scientists specializing in natural resources governance. The year before, she was honored with the award for social impact by the prestigious National Academy of Finland. She was a globe-trotting expert on the in interactions between human beings and nature, and frequently travel from Yoensu to places like the United Nations in New York, Tanzania, Nepal, Mexico, Mon Mozambique, and Laos to promote collaboration between government, business, youth, and communities on natural resources governance. On this early afternoon autumn night, Irumeli met my family near the city square, and we headed for the festival grounds 
on the nearby island of Ilosari. In the middle of the Pielioski River, where an outdoor movie and music event that she had invited us to was supposed to be starting shortly. But all through the day, it had been raining. I was surprised the event had not been canceled yet. This made little sense. I asked, will they move the show indoors because of the weather? Why, of course not, Irumeli replied quizzically. We all have the right clothes on. And remember, as we Finns say, there is no bad weather, only inadequate clothing. Irumeli's son who, son, who had a cold but didn't want to stay at home and missed the fun, sneezed. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, nor did his mother. The Finns took these sayings very seriously to the point of sending all the nation's school children outdoors every day for multiple 15-minute outdoor recesses, regardless of the weather in snow, ice, rain, and temperatures as low as minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Up ahead on the bridge to the island, I saw there were long columns of local couples, families, groups of friends gamely trudging through the mud and slop toward the event. When we got there, I couldn't believe my eyes. There were dozens of Finnish men, women, and children standing contently still outside in the open air, in the rain, stoically waiting for a movie to begin on the jumbo screen. To my even bigger surprise, off to the side, a group of naked adults relaxed discreetly while submerged in a small outdoor portable hot tub and sauna on wheels sipping champagne. In many parts of the world, weather like this would send people running for shelter. But here in rural Finland, these were perfectly normal conditions in which to take your loved ones, including small ch children, to watch an outdoor movie. This is a short film about the woods and mountains of Koli National Park, an hour north of here, Ilmeli explained. The movie started, and the majestic opening chorus of Finlandia by Jean Sibelius boomed through the speakers. The screen revealed the magnificent visuals of Koli. Around me, the crowd was transfixed. We were standing outdoors in thick mist and rain, fully exposed to the elements, practically swimming in mud on a little island in the middle of a river, watching a movie about a forest. I asked Irumeli what the name of the island Ilosari means. It's Finnish for island of joy, she smiled. Of course, it's called the island of joy, I thought. That makes perfect sense. So I, I especially appreciated your descriptions there and throughout of the depth of the quiet that is so natural in Finland and especially Joensu and unusual elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So can you comment a bit about this natural quiet in Finnish cities and forests? And is there something different about North Karelia? Well, yes. I One day soon after we arrived there, uh, I was walking along the river and suddenly I realized that it was very quiet. And I had to stop so my sneakers were not rubbing against the gravels, making noise. And I listened. And I realized that I was not hearing man-made noises I was so used to all my life. Traffic, fire engines, especially in New York or background music in stores, or people talking behind me on the sidewalk, or just random, just basic layers of noises. And I further listened, and I realized it was not totally dead silent. I heard 
nature. I heard leaves rustling. I lived, I heard wind and river going down like little murmurs. And it's so calming. And I just loved it. And I realized that it's really important to have this quietness in life. And the longer I lived in Finland, I noticed this important of, importance of a quietness. Thank you that it's, it is one of those things that it's once you've experienced it, it kind of sticks with you um, mm -hmm. forever. And kind of thinking of that, in what ways has your experience in Finland stayed with you since you returned to New York? Well, uh, of course I missed Finland. At the same time, I really, it was nice for me to be able to go back fresh and rediscover all the wonderful amenities um, that the city offers. And there are two things in particular I did. Um, in a playground across the street from our apartment building, I saw a sign for Green Day, uh, Plant Day, Volunteer Day. And we had, you know, our son and I had volunteered in city parks and different things. And I also volunteered for Sierra Club in the past. But this, I never even saw that there were gardens in the playground. And we went gardening. And then, and then this time I took even further and I become an active member. And I did fundraising for the playground and raised some money from organizations so we could buy extra plants and put some signs um, and that was really wonderful. And I met uh, local uh, women volunteers who lived in the area for many years. So in a way I recreated my sisterhood in the nature in the middle of the city um, the way I did in uh, Yoensu. And the second thing was to join New York Ecological Society. I just thought like maybe there are people in upstate New York or in Connecticut that go mushroom hunting. And surprisingly, there was a group and there is still is a group in the city and they go to parks in the city um, looking for mushrooms. And they're more scientific, like identifying in addition to, I mean, some people are foodies and they go foraging in different parts of America, uh, but in the city, what they're doing is more scientific research and catalog cataloging what kind of mushrooms are living uh, in that area. So those two things. Fantastic. And could you further just briefly tell us about how you've been involved with the Finlandia Foundation? Oh, yes. Uh, Finlandia Foundation National, we received the grant to finish this book and the grant helped us do final leg of research and then to come here. And so without it, we would may not be sitting here. Thank you, everybody at Finlandia Foundation National. Great. Yeah, no extra special thanks to them. And one more question on the book. Um, so I thought you all really quite skillfully worked in Finland's historical and social context all throughout. And so how did this process work? Did you learn parts through conversations and fill in the gaps later? Or what just kind of what can you speak to that process a little bit? Well, my husband, William Doyle, and I, um, having worked on the Japanese food books, this one, we work very well together. Uh, some people are shocked to hear this, but a husband and a wife team. But uh, we work very well and it was a very simple, I mean, easy uh, process um, in a way that we both agreed our, our impressions were the same. What we wanted to say were very similar. Um, and of course, writing a book, it takes a long time. Like I have ideas, but you have to sit down and string words to make sense. Um, at the same time, also, we always want to substan substantiate our discoveries or findings with respectable research data and expert opinions. So same thing with the Japanese food books. Uh, my husband does most of the research and I tell stories and I tell my experiences, my impressions, and, and then combine the two uh, facts to make it, it a full, full, uh, full story. Gotcha. Well, it's, it sounds incredibly complimentary and it created, created a beautiful product. Um, and so just 
final question for you is what what do you envision as your relationship with Finland in the future? Well, needless to say, Finland has become my third home after Japan and the U.S. And I hope to spend a lot of time here. And a lot of it is still mystery. Um, and I continue to read and, and have a deeper understanding of all the themes that I touched upon in the book, food, foraging, and gender equity, and even design, interior, and then how beautiful interior architecture affects your mood. And that's another wellness factor that I want to further uh, look into. And in May, I'm taking a uh, herb class, a seven hour herbal class with cooking and tasting. I'm looking forward to it. I'm also visiting, I'm taking a tour at Villa Mairea, uh, Alva Alto's magnificent mansion um, in May. And I love that. And I think that um, I'm also taking classes on Shinrin Yoku, which is uh, forest ba forest bathing is the, the term coined by the Japanese uh, forest minister in 1982. And this is a science behind the reason why walking in forest really enhances your wellness. So I help to, to walk through many, many, much part of forests in Finland and also in Japan. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to your your <laughs> next next work and thank you so much for being here with us today thank you for having me <laughs>